existence. Uh, you know, you know Wendell Berry, right? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. There's there's an existence of like coming back and living where you grew up. And, yes. And, and and sort of saying, there's a lot of people I could reference, but uh, finding that the bigness in that tiny little corner. Yes. Uh, yes. And you go and you come back. You still go and come back constantly. And you still, I still reach far and and, and still come back. But it it uh, it build, it builds a, a totally different kind of relationship with it. One where your separation of it comes in little, like many bouts. You know what I mean? Yes, like absolutely. You have to absolutely. separate yourself from it at times. Yeah, I, I I always had this sense: if I stay still too long, something within me dies. And if I'm two nights too long in a hotel, oh, something God. within me dies. Yeah. So there's some like rhythm, there are these like polarities of grounded and flying, and I'm endlessly like either one of them, if you overplay them, you're in trouble. Yep. yep. Um, like I assume when you're rowdy and you're like, can I do those nights in a row? Like, like you're trying to guess. Um, and like, if I'm out that many nights, does something happen at, at do I miss something you know central it. to who I am at home? But if I'm home too long and I'm not doing what I'm here to do, how did you, did you have a model for staying where you're from and who did you look to when you were doing um, Well, it's changed as we've gone along. I didn't, I didn't think a lot about it when we were younger. It was you all- just went, uh, just go. Econo- it was economical, yeah, and yeah. it was economical. Like, I, first, my wife and I moved up to Asheville. So that was, you know, that was enough away from Charlotte where we were from, the area of Concord where we were from. But then economically, we were like, well, we are gonna be able to do what we want to do if we can uh, decrease this, the expenses. If yeah. we can lessen the expenses here, we'll be able to do more of what we love. So we did that by coming to a, a place that we could afford uh, easier with a nurse and a, a guy that was making $6,000 a year <laughs> on the road <laughs> and making paintings in between. So um, so we came back. That was economical. But then as I dug in and kept traveling and stayed and it was convenient enough and it worked well mechanically, then the spiritual part of it starts to that relationship along with everything else you know in my in my mid 30s that was when it started the awareness of it awaking uh, like waking up to the reality of this is the same dirt you were running in when you were yeah eight years old what does that mean is is it does it mean anything is it good is it bad have you honored the need to leave like i feel like we should like we're supposed to in some sense and so it right. starts becoming a metaphorical and a physical thing that uh, I just try to stay aware, aware of and, and honor it and, and know that it may it may come a time where we do completely like that we go. Maybe yeah. it's not. But it's it, not. Yeah. But this works. This the, set aside from like, you know, pandemics and such. This <laughs> rhythm works for you. It does. It does. Because this was always the stuff that was most interesting to me. Like the, the, the director, the writer, the singer, what they were putting out was fascinating, but I was equally or more fascinated. How did they set up their life? Same, same here. I was always asking like the chili peppers. I would ask yeah, uh, right. uh, Chad Smith when we were meeting Chad. I was like, well, how long do you guys stay out? You know, like yes. when do you go home? Cause you have, these guys have kids. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what is, what's the deal? And they would say a lot of the same things. There was kind of a two to three week window where you just bounce back and make sure everything was, you know, just keep the fires burning. And that was definitely a model. I think about Springsteen a lot about how he went back to Jersey and lived there and raised a family and right. And did it successfully. I remember there was somebody I really admired when I got to ask them questions. And I think I asked them what kind of, what kind of car do you drive? Totally. And as I said it, I was like, why am I, I could ask this person, this person has done this mass expense and I want to know, and I had some question like on a Tuesday morning at like 11, where would you be? They were yeah. so particular because yeah, yeah. that was what helped me like understand, okay, that's how they're, gonna, they're doing this. <laughs> yeah. You know, the painter, David Sally. You I seen don't. His work? Okay. Mm-mm. Incredible work. But uh, yeah, he's, he's a legend. He's, he's a living legend. But uh, I was watching a talk he did and he said, you know, artists, critics of art, critics ask and, and, 
the audience members ask, why did the artist do this, right? And the artists always ask each other, how? How? How did you do it? How'd you yes. make it work? And that's so yes. what we do. That's yes. so what we do. There's, um, there's a sculptor named Thomas Hausego. Okay. He's British. He okay. makes giant pieces of like bodies and heads that are like yeah. 12 feet tall. Um, I saw one of his at the Bro downtown LA and we, it's like the kind of stuff that's so visceral and big that you walk into a room and it's vibrating the whole room. Yeah. Um, he lives, I was reading this piece about him. He lives on uh, that hill, literally that hill over there. And his studio is in downtown LA, which is like there, but just having like seeing this piece of art in a gallery, having it just like blow my hair back. But then like that guy puts his pants on <laughs> right over there in that neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah. drives down probably that street or that street yeah um yeah like suddenly grounded the mysterious work and like how you, how it gets done so hey cool guys. <laughs> yes I, we're I, gonna I, go forever so i know i know yeah. i know i love it Jump in when you need to <laughs> unfiltered <laughs> backstage access i love it i love it um i just want to give a quick formal intro and welcome everyone um, we kicked this off live right out of the gate. So um, we've been we've been live with you for a, a few minutes now. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm Heidi Lewis from Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, DC. We are so excited for this event today. I mean, talk about a silver lining, you know, in this horrible situation that we're in. Um, we look for these moments and this is one of them, having Rob Bell here with us for a virtual independent bookstore event. Um, you're on a six city bookstore tour. Is that right, Rob? Or more than that? Six Whatever that I'm in my front yard, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's just such a pleasure and honor to have you here talking about your new book. Um, Thank you. Everything is spiritual. And um, I had this like really canned formal intro written that now just feels inauthentic to read, um, given that we've been live already. But I just want to say one thing to sort of tee up this this conversation. Um, in the first part of your book, you talk about how the questions of the why, the questions of the why of darkness and suffering didn't really ever speak to you. And yeah. you, were you were more drawn to ask, now what? And if there, if there is a better question for us to ask in this moment, I, do, I don't know what it is because now what is what gets me up, is what keeps me moving, is what gets yeah. me thinking about how I can get through this time. Um, so I hope you and our distinguished Grammy nominated artist guest, <laughs> <laughs> Scott Avid of the Avid All Brothers. Right. All right. <laughs> Um, we'll explore this question today um, in the hour we have together. So friends, fam, everyone who's here tuning in, thank you so much. Thank you for your support. Please buy the book from Politics and Prose Bookstore. I'm going to keep throwing it in that chat link and I won't stop, can't stop because <laughs> we need your support. Support um, your local bookstore. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say goodbye. Um, Chat will stay open, log your questions for Scott and Rob into the Q&A, and they will take some of those towards the end. All right? Anything All right. else? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> Fantastic. Here we are. Yes, we are, Rob. <laughs> it's so good to be here. Yeah. I, I put up a thing, uh, like I realized as I was doing it, I've only done it a couple times. Uh, on Instagram where it's just a straight up, like as, as a couple sentence long, uh, my book critiques. <laughs> and there's only been a couple of them I've done. But uh, when I was, I had a little spark of a moment where I thought, you know, this book, uh, so many books I've, I've looked to for answers. I've looked to for endings, you know, the end of a searching at the end of a seeking. And this book does something so different. It, it, it opens up good and and stays open once it's finished and leads like like an eternal passage is what i thought of like it it helps guide a, a type of guide through this eternal passage that it really has to all be there is no yeah. there is no end right uh, right and so the book really does a great job of being this passage uh that that i love i love it Oh, good. It's, uh, with, with your life as the <laughs> as the yes. medium, I suppose, as memoir. Yeah, right? yeah. I kept 
quite quickly, I realized the book was a feeling as much as anything. It's like there are certain things that if you say them, you'd ruin it. Yeah. It's, it's like the thing that you're communicating that's baked into what you're doing that gets picked up more than explicitly. Like an Avid Brothers show is incredibly hopeful. But if you were like, we want you guys tonight to feel hope, you just killed it. it like the, the moment you have to name it certain things, the moment it's explicitly named, we just now don't have it. Or That's we've, exactly right. we've done something and right away when I realized, oh, is there some way to write about, first off, is there some way to write about the particulars of what it's like to be me? It's like double down on the particulars because that's where you find everybody. Um, that, that's how you get to the universals is this is what they were wearing. It was a green sweater. 100%. His name was Kyle. They were, were eating a ham sandwich. There were these 100%. strange details that oddly enough are how you get into it. And there was like this double down on the particulars and trust that it's somehow about everybody and that there's this feeling of mystery isn't that which you can't know. Mystery is that which you can know endlessly. Mm -hmm. no. And for many people, like, dude, it's all a mystery. What Sometimes what they mean is like it's an ambiguous hairball. No, 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 no. You can know it. You can just keep knowing it <laughs> endlessly, which is a very different feeling about life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you uh, do you stay in much of a constant? Um, I know I do in, in a constant study pattern of of a lot of Christian mystics, also like Rumi, uh, Sufi uh, mystic. Yes. But uh, I stay in a constant rhythm of 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 that study. Um, do you think that this is uh, is in line with that with with their their teachings? Oh my! In line might not be the word. In line. No, no. In word. the spirit of sure. In the spirit of. That's why I start. There's like that Rumi quote at the very beginning. That's right. Because it was almost like I somehow find Rumi so my my soul. I'm you. You. I'm sure you as well. Like, how did this 12th century crazy Sufi mystic? He literally talks about atoms and particles. Like how, um, and even, I'm, I'm sure you had a similar experience. In many ways, the world, we're, we're like sons of the modern age, which worshiped literalism. Like that's how you build an airport and a hospital and put an iPhone in everybody's pocket is mm -hmm. facts, logic. And yet this dimension of the human experience that doesn't fit in those categories. Yeah. And then you stumble into it to the 12th century Sufi mystic named Rumi, who's naming that which is just as real as anything you can hold in your hand. Yeah. And yeah. it's like speaks. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, how did it work? Did you, did you, I mean, I know your grandfather was a preacher. Mm -hmm. So did you grow up in that war in that world? Did you go hear your grandfather? No. So he died. He baptized me. And then he died the year that I was born, 76. So, oh, wow. But, and so his book, there was a book of collected sermons uh, that sat on our, our uh, shelf, our, our bookshelf in the, the dining room all my life. And, you know, it was just, it was just granddaddy's book. It didn't look, it didn't look very hip. It didn't look very interesting. You know, I always thought my grand, I'd look at him and it's amazing how I look at him as so handsome and so beautiful now. Where I used to look at it and be like, oh, it's sure is an awkward looking old man, like as a kid. <laughs> now I see it and I see, I see pure beauty, you know? Um, right. But eventually, you know, somewhere in my 30s, I picked it up and I realized how radical he was for the 40s to the 70s in, as a Methodist minister in North Carolina. He's, he's referencing Gandhi and he's, oh, he, wow. he's praising Martin Luther King. Uh, uh, he's, he's, Really, he's really tied uh, uh, closely to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. So, oh, like, way ahead, like, like really close. And in the, you know, yeah. then that was not, you know, that's that's the beginnings of it, right? I don't remember what year it started, but it was very early. But yeah. anyway, um, so he was really my 
yeah, he, he guided me into that, but that was much older. I didn't really, we didn't really grow up. We grew up, my, our dad was the son of a preacher. So his take on it was don't take this stuff so serious. Really? He was like, let's go to Sunday school and then let's go get some lunch. It's okay. Don't, don't have a conniption over it. Just, you know, he was always like, it's all right. Don't, don't get so worked up about it. Yes. God. Yes. But don't get, don't get crazy about it. It's okay. It's all right. Be calm and cool and rational. Be a good citizen. Yeah. So, yeah. Don't, don't get... Be compassionate, you know? Yeah. So, but I, you know, I tied really like reading your book and to back up for a second, even the way you were, you organize words in the book is very roomy esque because it mm. gallivants, it gallivants around. It's, it's a smorgasbord of, of conversation. And I'm thinking, you know, that's Rumi's life was a smorgasbord of sure, gallivant. Sure, sure, sure. And I love that. And, and I think that, uh, for instance, what you were saying a little bit ago, our, our bass player, Bob, and our brother, Bob, uh, the, the third member of the Avid Brothers in the core group, he, yeah. uh, he said once, what I love is that we don't write because we sit down and say, we want to write a song about X. Yeah, right. No, we write because we're we feel x and we write it so when it comes to us we write it we don't go after that's right. what's diff that makes it difficult to write about um uh current affairs a lot of times because unless you're other than the news unless you're in them like if you're at the protest you're going to be writing about it there's no doubt about it you're going to feel it yeah but if you're not there and you decide i'm going to write a song about protests it's like okay this is a bad <laughs> it's a bad call right here um <laughs> But I didn't get out of my system. But your upbringing in the book, you talk about living on a hobby farm. And uh, I think there's something to that. Like the, the in a way, it, it does tie to that room in the smorgasbord of life. We were we were both uh, we both grew up in, in sort of a setting like that that offered a variety, I guess, of experience. I'm not sure because we would we would reach out, I guess, and, and find the the. Um, oh, no. Hold on. My iPad is talking to me. <laughs> because we could go to um, California on TV, or we might fly there occasionally and see it. Um, right. But we were also being raised in a place that was very colorful, uh, with a lot of variety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the same. So my dad was a judge, so he put on a suit each morning. And like wingtips, like legit wingtips. Yeah. And went and his like he wore a black robe when he got to work. And there That's was a, a whole and everybody called him judge. And when he would walk in a room, walk into the courtroom, everybody stood. So like I would visit my dad in this intellectual law, um, very formal world. Then he would come home and there was this old farmer down the street named Dale Grettenberger who remembered when the whole suburban area we lived on this hobby farm was farms and Dale would show up and you know, that guy with the panel van that was filled with tools. So it rode really low. Yeah. And my dad would be in the driveway in a briefcase and suit, having just got home from work, talking to Dale about the three point hitch on the John Deere. And it, it was, it was clicking a little and maybe we should get some new uh, axle grease for that. And it was like, are we like trying to be farmers? Are we intellectuals? Are, I just go to a suburban middle school. I just came from soccer practice. Yes. What, what are, we're like, we duct tape together a number of things here. That's right. Exact same for us. I mean, it was very similar. Now my dad yeah. was, was in a blue collar scenario, but, but education was always pushed on it. Like it was, it was, it was, it was a priority, you know? And, it, and I think that did so. That's, that's an element there. I think. When, if I would have met you when you were 17, 18, 19, what and said like what what do you see yourself doing what would you uh, have said um well I, I was way into soccer okay i thought i was going to college go. to play soccer I did. I did go to college i went to one practice and then was like this stinks <laughs> Walk so, away. that's so it's amazing rob because i went to a practice <laughs> got on a team in alabama uh university of montevella they accepted me they said yes we'll give you a scholarship and I secretly wanted to stay in North Carolina because of a girl. But my excuse was, I want to be in bands. I want to be a singer. I'm a singer in a band. And that's my, that's my, my love. So I'm going to go to Chapel Hill or, or ECU 
in North Carolina, these college towns. And I ended up going to ECU and being, which leads us into the lead singer. I wrote a note, lead singer syndrome, which <laughs> you obviously have. And I have. Yeah, ap apparently, though, you took it a little farther. Let's just say that. I guess maybe I convert. Clearly, I converted it into a different totally. space. Totally. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Because when I hear you, uh, like when I first heard you, I was like, oh, there's a preacher in there somewhere. Like, uh, like your grandfather handed you, your grandfather's leaving and he hands something to you on the way out. I'm not sure that's, you've thought about that's that. That's the best often, thing but... you could say. That's nice. That's nice. Oh, yeah. Know. Yeah. You think about souls coming and going from this space time continuum. There's actually all sorts of interesting research about compatibility that skips a generation. Um, these these uh, historians, Strauss and Howe, do, did all this general research on grant, why grandparents and kids, grandkids often connect more at like a deeper soul level than sometimes parents and kids at certain things. Yeah. But like your grandfather's like leaving. He's like, well, I use this. Here, here you go, bud. It's awesome. It'll make sense in about 20 years. I'll be gone, but it'll make sense. Go ahead. That's <laughs> awesome. But that's what happened to me is the band failed. But when I discovered the sermon, I was like, wait a second. This is all that without sound check. It really is. <laughs> it really is. It's hounded me all my life when I think about it. I, I think you, you did. You obviously did the right thing. I had hit my musical ceiling. I had also hit my musical ceiling. You, did you know it's, what was the point at which you thought, oh, this is actually going to be like my trade? Like well, crap. I have definitely like, not hit my ceiling yet. I've got a lot of improvement to do. So that's <laughs> like, I'm happy for that. Like I'm still I meant going. ceiling like ability. We just all <laughs> of a sudden, if it moved past the key of G, I was out. I was like, what's going on here? Me too. Me too. I, I think with a brother, you know, we were working with each other a lot and we were helping to pull each other along. But uh, I, once we knew it was uh, something to make a living by, I would say that probably would have been 2000. Uh, well, we committed to it in 2003. We said, we won't work any other jobs. There won't be any part-time jobs anymore. So we made that dedication to each other. We, that was like a moment. That was, was a like moment. a ceremony where you like having was, a meal. Well, 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 I got married. Actually, my, the, the marking uh, was my marriage. When I got married, I said, I'm not going back to that. We were working a janitorial job with a, a friend of ours, um, cleaning, cleaning bathrooms. And we were all out of college, but we were like, well, we don't want a job to hold us down. We want to be able to move freely. And then we all said, you know what? We're never going to take the bad music jobs if we've always got these other jobs. We're going to be picky. So we want to go to NACA and do the college, the cafeteria gigs, which were really, yeah. they're really challenging. You know, they're really challenging. Pete Holmes does a, does a bit on that, you know? So we related on that a lot. Uh, but so once we, once we committed, that was the mark where we said, this is what we're going to go for. So intention there was, was clear, which, and from there, it wasn't a professional level yet, but I, I think once we started working with Rick Rubin, we were definitely professional amateurs. There's no doubt we were making a living. We were going to, we were professionals, but that was a good mark of like, we're now working with several other people that are, are professionals as well. So it's, so anyway, and we, and we, we just keep doing it. We just keep doing it and trying to listen and, and be awake. And I love, see, this is always fascinating to me you knew that if you had other job, you'd be picky. So you just had to take whatever it brought you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to me, that is, I remember one of the first preaching gigs I ever got was a county fair and in a tent. It, it well better a horse racing track. And they'd put the, the stage on the infield across from the track part. And they had put a roof on the stage, but I'm six, three. And the roof was like for hobbits. It was like five, <laughs> ten or something. So I got up to speak, but they said, before you give your sermon, it was a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. And special, whatever fair weekend, they said, there's going to be some special music. And it was a guy on a keyboard and a guy on a bass. And they started playing, but the keyboard blew up. Like it literally fizzled and popped. And it was just, <laughs> So they were trying to have everybody sing along to a bass. 
<laughs> and I'm 25 years old, exactly what you're describing. All I know is to say yes to everything. The only way this works. There can be no ego. It's just, there's this thing that I think I'm here to do. So just take every single opportunity. And I got up to speak and my head was, the, the tarp was resting on my head. So I jumped <laughs> off the stage. So I was like, I can't, this is not going to work. So I jumped off the stage down onto the actual horse racing track uh -huh. to talk to the people in the stands. And there's like 20 people in the entire stands. None of them are sitting closer than 20 feet. And I have a, like an old school black Bible and I open it up because it has my notes of what I'm going to say. And at that moment, I realized that the track is actually like a wind tunnel and it takes all of my notes and just blows them immediately <laughs> out of the fair, out of the racing track. And I remember standing there. I didn't know how to, at that point, I would have had anything memorized. And like, oh, this is the path I've chosen. Like, this is, this is all it. the stories I've read. Everybody said about how you start. This is what it's like. You're standing there in front of these 20 people with an open Bible, but no idea what to say. And then I stumbled my way through it. And then my wife, Kristen, we had just gotten married. And I'm thinking, what is she thinking about this guy? <laughs> that she's with is this what we're going to do with our lives and we're walking back to our 1991 honda civic yes and the organizer comes over and hands me an envelope and i open it up and it's a check for a hundred dollars and i'm like whoa and we get in the car and kristen says what was in that check and i say a hundred bucks like i am you're with the man here <laughs> and she says you can't take money from those four people and we argue. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Did you take we it back? Argue. We oh, okay. argue about the ethics of taking the honorarium from this yeah. event. Young punk like, rockers, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. But I'm so struck with the that feeling like you know you're here to do this thing. And the only path is the cap the cafeteria circuit. That's what's available. So you just throw yourself into it. It's that's the only way it works. And then it doesn't really change for you and I right now. It's still not, not throw all that yourself into yeah. it. That's what I wanted to articulate there. And that the metaphor of you losing all those notes in that Bible, that's happened over and over through your life, right? Exactly. Which goes back to the feeling of the book. Like, it's not like you reach this space where suddenly you just glide. Um, you, there's something about the wobbly figuring out as you go that's not to be eliminated. It's, it means you're onto it. I mean, I assume, I mean, for you, I assume there's going to be another Avett Brothers album, which means you come up with something from scratch which means you go through all the same, what is this? Is this, do I like this song that's coming out of me? Is this good? Does this need another middle eight? Does this, what key is it in? Right? I mean, you just yeah. start from scratch, no matter how many times you've done it. Every time. And I, and I still, I don't think that, I don't think that I know how to, I don't, I don't know one way, an only way to write a song. How do I say it? I don't know the way to write a song. I really don't. Right. I don't know right. the way. I, I, I just I just do it when and sometimes I ignore it. Sometimes it's calling on me and I'm doing something else and I go, not now. You know, it's yeah. I'm, I'm I'm I am discriminating against that that yeah. uh calling and that idea. Because there's a lot of them. There's no end to them. Yeah. Um, so like this week, do you have a song rattling around in you right now? Or an idea or uh, a plan? yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was it this morning? Well, I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I've been thinking a lot about hermeneutics. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I did not see that coming. <laughs> well, for those of I, you uh, keeping score, for those of you keeping score at home, hermeneutics. The fact that you use that word is awesome. Would be like almost like how you read something. Is that how you would explain what hermeneutics are? Interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. How you interpret it. How you read it. So. Yeah, that's how it. <laughs> So how, Scott David, have you been thinking about hermeneutics? Well, I, yeah, there's, I don't know, like it, it's a, 
I, I, I started thinking about it because I learned from Richard Rohr in his, in his book, uh, what do we do with the Bible? I th- yeah. It's four chapters and one of them is hermeneutics. And so yeah. I just thought that was just a, uh, a beautiful word and a beautiful uh, yeah. uh, subject. And his idea being, let's treat scripture like Jesus treated scripture. That's his, his offering there. Yep. And I'm like, yep. wow. Wow. Yep. Like it's so simple and so mind blowing. Yep. That being said, it, it gets me thinking about what is my hermeneutic. And so I've been thinking a lot about how does holy text, how does scripture, uh, how much I don't know. Like I just didn't, I didn't take the time, you know, I didn't, I didn't go, I didn't lead with scripture. Um, so I'm interested in it as a found, as a, as a template or as a, uh, as a grid to work off of. Uh, not as much to find the answer, but a place to uh, practice the searching sort of, you know? Absolutely. And like in the, like in the Kabbalah tradition, the ancient text is, it's these black etchings, like uh, a text is black etchings on white space. And so in Kabbalah and with the Hebrew art of Midrash, the black etchings are the sacred text but then the white space around the black etchings is the endless commentary on the black etchings. So they say that visually the text is the picture of what you do with it. You take, you fill in the white space with your own stories and in, in your own interpretation, your own light, you, you read it and it reads you. Your so memoir. As opposed to narrowing, it's actually an ex- a sacred text is actually an expansive thing. Right. This is what these people in this place at this time were giving expression to. Go. Yeah. What's it say to you? What's it do to you? What's it bringing up in you? What, how, how 2020 is it? Which, which is how Jesus is. I mean, most every, and there's like maybe two places where Jesus is asked a question that he doesn't respond with a question. Otherwise, every time he's asked a question, he question. responds. I know. How do you interpret it? How do you read it? So what do good. you think it says? It's like, it's an invitation. It's the opposite of brainwashing. It's like, he's inviting everybody to grow up. It is. Like, what do you think? <laughs> what do you read? What have you been reading recently? Or like, well, I, I, I took a break while your book, let's see, what was I reading? I was reading rivalries. It's a book about, uh, um, artists that had rivalries, uh, Francis Bacon and Lucian Freud oh, had a nice. rivalry and explains their relationship. Yeah. Um, what was it before? I'm, I'm listening right now. I've just started Life of the Beloved again. I listened to Life of the Beloved from Henry now. And uh, when I oh. paint, I digest a lot of audiobooks. My my go-to is New Seeds of Contemplation, which is I just I over and over and over <laughs> and over. Okay, it so is, how long do you paint? So you're listening to an audiobook. You go in the morning. Do you know what you're going to paint? Right now I do because I've got a very organized so I'm doing an opposite of what I used to do, it, which was like, what will, what will happen? And just, just see what will happen. Now I'm setting a grid and it's very particle atom oriented because it's small grids and it's a lot of time in each grid. So I know exactly what I'm going to do. I know how long it takes. Or I, I know what I'm going to attempt to do. I know how long it takes to do certain amounts. And I've, I may maybe have two hours. And so that's what I'll do for two hours. Um, and when you come in and, and like at the, when you start the two hour, you know, you have a two hour window. Is it paint to brush right away? Do you have to get into a groove? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you- I got to be relaxed. We, I, I think uh, to, if I'm going to use this morning as an example, I was listening to a song by the Felice Brothers last week and then on through the weekend. And uh, I listened to it again this morning. It's called The Mating of the Doves. And Ian Felice is singing as God. And he's saying, if you think I'm coming back to you pitiful people, right. you're crazy. But I will come back down to witness the mating of the doves. And it is so special and so brilliant and so dark and beautiful and oh, everything. So this morning I was listening to it after I dropped the kids off from school. And I was like, I got to go record this song. I got to go put it out in the world. So I went and did it. A cover of it. Yeah, a cover of it. And put it on Instagram. I do that every now and again. It's a good place to exercise, you know, all that. And then, uh, 
And then I sat with this, uh, the painting I'm working on now, and I had uh, a couple pieces on it I was going to do as I, but I sat, I, I like to sit first and get relaxed. I think good things happen when I'm relaxed and going slow. Yeah. And then the, and then the paint starts, the brush, the paint, then, it, then it starts, but, yeah. but currently these squares, there's like a overall, sounds like you already have like the structure or the architect, the, the plan of what it is you're making. I do. I do. But other times, are you just following? You don't have that? You're just I'm, seeing where it goes? I might make an image. I might make an image of something on the canvas, and then that, that dictates what that, that negative space wants. And then uh, I'll put yeah, another yeah. image. It might just be a photograph that, or a picture that I took. And I'm really, I just know that the, it's just, it just needs to be painted, and I'll do it. Um, I, I did two portraits of my grandparent my, on my mom's side, large scale, uh, a couple months ago. Um, one one thing with this grid idea, one aspect to it is is does it matter what I'm painting? The question is, is does it really matter what the image is at all? Right. 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 It's right. really it, it could be arbitrary now. The meaning of it will be found. People will find some meaning, no matter what they're looking at. And and it's up to me formally to make the composition in a song or a painting. I can I can dial it in a little if I want, but I might not need to touch it at all. Right. And I've been inspired by uh, Malcolm Morley is a painter who passed away in 2018, who actually inspired this approach 100 percent. I really loved what he was doing. And I thought, well, what's my version of that? Mm -hmm. you know, what's my version of that and that goes to uh you you said in i haven't listened to the whole thing i started it the other day the velvet elvis you mentioned painters take from old you take from the other painter yeah and it keeps going you continue on yeah it can never be his painting it can't be malcolm morley's painting it's mine um <laughs> right. you know, and it i'm right. just carrying on the tradition and building on it from me so i have trust that it's going to be and you know it's going to be a scott abbott work but now it's about being with this work it's not about how fast can I get it finished? Where will it go? How can, what does it say? It's not about any of that. It's about being with this painting. And there's something in that that is, um, is definitely more fulfilling for me. Uh, and I think more, more positive in a relationship way. Absolutely. Uh, Louis Kahn, some people think the greatest American architect used to begin a project by asking, what does this building want to be? Yeah. And I, I don't know how many years ago I came across that. It's so good. The idea of the thing that you're making, there's a compelling force. It, something draws you towards something, but then there's an impelling force, which is it comes up from within. And as soon as I started talking to the things I was making, like, what do you want to be? Yeah. yeah. Almost like you're walking with it and it's, revealing it almost like it already exists you know they always say like the best pop songs you hear them and you feel like they've always existed yeah it's yeah. just somebody showed up who they came through yeah um yeah. i'm sure you had this when you would i would get out an acoustic guitar in order to learn like the the newest springsteen song i loved and be like what the two chords <laughs> totally oh or you every time. or you you two one chord with a delay pedal what? every time every time St structurally anybody technically could have played this but they did <laughs> right and then you're like it did it just always exist but somebody was open humble pure at heart then that well, came a does it happen in a sermon too absolutely i mean it happens um something arises but it's like what is this uh this happened to me a couple of weeks ago, Jesus gets, the first thing he does is he's baptized and he enters into the waters and he comes out of the waters and spirit says, this is my son. But there's this principle of first mention, which is anytime you see something in a text asked, where's the first mention of this? Well, the first mention of entering into waters and spirit is in Genesis one, the spirit of God enters and hovers over the waters. And the word for hover in Hebrew is the idea of a bird's wings. So Genesis 1, spirit is hovering like a bird over the water, the formless and void, then enters into the water 
And out of it comes all this vast explosive diversity and creativity and design. So when these gospel writers are telling you the Jesus story, they tell you about him being baptized. He enters into waters and then there's spirit that says, this is my boy. So they're actually saying this story is about new creation. They're, they're saying he comes to keep this beautiful pattern of new creation in play. Um, and then you start going this right now in this year of massive upheaval, that's the invitation. Where's the new creation in? Cause the waters are stirring. It's chaotic. It's dark. Yeah. It's tohu va vohu. That's the Hebrew, like formless and void. It's chaos. What is truth? How do we get media? Um, how do we think about rich and poor? Um, now is the time to be looking for spirit because this is how it's worked. So it's like something like a connection from here to here is suddenly about police brutality. It's suddenly about income inequality. It's something about caring for the earth. It's mm -hmm. like a constellation forms in a non-linear, almost like impressionistic atmospheric way. Mm -hmm. And I picture this ancient story of Jesus entering the waters. And then I'm like, oh, I know what it's called. This is called this sermon is called, and then you step into the water. Yeah. So then suddenly there's like a, there's the chorus. There's the hook. Okay. Yeah. Um, Have you done that sermon yet? I just did it on the Robcast. So I just released it like last week or something, two weeks ago. But that's it. Um, so it has like these, um, oftentimes like there's a constellation of things that are saying something. And I've learned now as I'm, more in heart and less stuck in head if you put all these things side by side they create something that if you say it you'll ruin it you know what i mean i do I so do. i'm much more trusting and confident just duct tape these things together and present them and trust that there's something inhabiting these different fragments and pieces they yeah. they are cohesive at a deeper level um yeah that's how it works so often there's a song there's music sure um you know brian eno's song ascent it's that yeah. super atmospheric song um there's certain songs that like over the years that, you know what i mean i can yeah. think of specific books that uh of course are related to it yeah of course so, yeah so what um, do you, so, so what's, what's next? I mean, obviously you all would have been playing gigs this year. Yeah, we would have. Yeah. Yeah. Several. And do you, how do you think about all this and where we're headed? I mean, not like with me, there's like next year's touring, but you just kind of smile and laugh and send the email back. Sure. Yeah. That yeah. sounds great. We'll see. Same. Yeah. Same. I think it's just taking time. We, you know, we take it, we take it real serious and uh, we, uh, we practice all the things, social distancing, masks, the kids are doing it. Um, at the same time, there's some sort of this, I don't, you know, it's not going anywhere. There's not gonna be a switch, you know, that's gonna just fix everything. Right. It's gonna be gradual. So right. I'm trying to, trying to navigate in a way that if we're healthy, we, we just do what we can uh, yeah. and try to protect the people that are really susceptible to, uh, yeah, right. to the, to the illness. Um, right, right, right. Not that we know for sure, but I'm just, you know, to, to best of our knowledge, uh, day at one day at a time, we're the same. We, we plan to work next year, but, uh, we'll see how it goes. It's, it's not on our time. Our time. Yes. Long. Yeah. Um, this, this whole, this whole experience, like 2020 just charged in and was like, I'm a year. I, I laugh so much about because well, we do our New Year's Eve celebration. And I mean, it was just like 2020. Everybody just cheer like within two months, the whole thing was just like out the door. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. What? Um, something that I really, like, I really just want to make sure I say and cover because, you know, life changing for me and it was around 40 was uh, was therapy in my life um, oh yeah and the thing you said about oh there's anger there's angry and then there's oh there's anger i mean i think 
when you said that, that there's that, you said that, and I was like, ah, oh, I just listened to uh, James Finley talking about Thomas Merton uh, having tea with a Zen master, where the Zen, and he says, uh, oh, it's a different story, but he say, he's, go, he's going out saying, the Zen masters are just like you and me. They feel the jealousy, but they go, oh, it's, it's just jealousy. I'm not jealousy, you know? I don't know which pants I'm gonna wear. The blue ones or the brown ones. Hey, it's just it's just indecision. It doesn't mean that you are, you know, indecision. Right. You're not here because you're afraid. You wake up in the hour of the wolf and you're you're worried about this and that, but that doesn't mean you're fear. It's just it's just that old that old buddy of yours or not old and whatever you call it. But I loved it. I love that, Rob. It's one of the most transforming when when you come to see it. That I remember the first time I I suddenly saw it spatially like oh look anger like passing through so good oh look indecision as so soon good. as i had like this spatial way of understanding there was a rob behind the rob and that rob's okay he's always been okay he's fine <laughs> oh so good yeah it's so yeah. good yeah yeah um the oil painter con uh, comment that you made too you, you said that chris and said well if you're going to be an oil painter you would make time to paint. That's what we do. Well, I'm I'm at odds all the time about. Oh, am I a painter or am I am I a songwriter? Am I a performer? Am I a painter? And you know, my therapist or my wife, both in the same, would say, "Just yes. relax. You don't have to smash one of them to the butt." But when you said that, I was like, oh, "All right, you know, this is stirring me. Like, oh, I've got to I've got to make the move. I've got to make the move." You really have that? Am I a painter or a singer? Do you have that to this day? A hundred percent. And who do you feel like you need to be able to answer that for? <laughs> <laughs> That's all you had to say. <laughs> who needs this clarity? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what, what, what I realize that when people ask me what I do, I could just decide in the moment what to tell them. Yeah. Oh my yeah. word, it got fun. I remember being at a party. What do you do? And saying, I'm working on some ideas. <laughs> it's perfect. The dumbest. The, and it worked for the person and being like, oh, this whole what do you do is that game was rigged from the get go. Mm -hmm. I totally ask me, ask me tomorrow. I'll tell you because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. But either way, just because you're doing one thing doesn't mean you have to smash the other. So no this is what we're doing now and then we'll do something else it is yeah later and we'll see where it takes us it is it is you know the, apparently there's some questions here do you want to yeah, do some questions let me see uh, what they are let's give let people ask you a question because then i'm going to have more questions for you <laughs> yeah anything you like in there yeah here, right off the top this is a good simple straightforward one from carolyn helmberger she says my question is does now what or what next scare you? Does now what or what's what uh, next scare you? I actually think that's that's the invitation of the fullness of life is to learn that that's the most interesting question is to move it from fear to anticipation and joy because um, it's the implication that the universe is going to move forward and you're going to expand right along with it and there's more so uh it is it takes well for me it took years although i think early on i sensed that was where all the action was and then you just are you align your life around that i'm sure you have the same thing when you i mean when you walk down to the barn in the morning now what yeah yeah um now yeah. what yeah, to me now, that's where all the life is. You uh, still get scared sometimes, though, right? Oh, yeah. I remember when, when this thing hit and everything got canceled for this year. And we're all in lockdown. And what am I going to do? I knew this book was coming out. Okay, six months from now, a book is coming out. But yeah. six months, what am I going to do? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, there was a good month here. I read a book on Freud. I read through it. 
I remember thinking it'd be a Tuesday afternoon in the one o'clock and I'd be on the couch yeah. just late. I'm sure you've had those where you're like, what, what is going on here? What am I doing with my life? What? Yo, oh, yeah. 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 What oh, you definitely, reading? definitely a project. To me, the most interesting work now is the work where I don't know if I can pull it off. I'll get an um, idea. Of course. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg quote. I, I was watching a little documentary because I wanted to figure out how he was doing his silk screens. And he says, uh, if I know how to do something, why in the world would I want to yeah. do it? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I feel that so much. Absolutely. The next three books are in my head. And my only questions are about them is <laughs> could, could that be a book? Could I, and I have this, this third play that I'm working on and the play, when I think about the opening scene, could, could that work? <laughs> yeah. That's the only interesting thing to me. Can anybody see your know. plays anywhere? Are your plays out there right now? Yeah. One of them, um, we did one or of them here in LA for workshops. The second one just got optioned for Broadway. So that there's a group of producers who want to are working so that it will be one of the play. I mean, this is all obviously, you know, um, yeah. Shooting up a shot from half court with your back yeah. to the rim. But, um, yeah, there's, it's being optioned. So, uh, so that it would be one of the first plays to be when Broadway reopens. So it's like a whole world I've never been in. Yeah. And I'm learning. You would love it. Play world is fascinating. And so yeah. I'll like literally like meetings this week, stop the people, the wonderful people I'm working with. Be like, what's that mean? Um, I'm sure for you, it's like, it's like three clicks over from the space I've been in. So yeah. I kind of know how a stage works, Yeah. but then they'll yeah. use a term like, wait, 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 what's that mean? Oh, wait, you can do that with lighting? No way. It's so it exciting. And we then the third idea. We have a play in the can as well. Do you really? Uh, yes. And it's, uh, it was going to be at uh, Berkeley Rep. And uh, you with you, you wrote it with who? No, no. Um, uh, it was written. It's a whole different. Hold on a sec. It's a it's whole thing. swept away. And what um, is your relation? You, you're a producer? No, 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 no. It's our music in it. It's, a, it's our music. Oh, in it. well, I'd go see that. Yeah, it's but no, it was set to, to start this summer, but it, obviously that all got. Yeah, uh, right. But right. yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great, that's a great question. But I get, no, I get what you're saying. The, the, when we um, got a little glimpse of that world, the lighting, the sound, everything was just like, oh my gosh, what a, plat what a, a, a medium, what a platform. Incredible. Right. Cause I, cause you know how to put on a show, but then a play is like one half click over, or yeah. it's like you, it a lot of your musculature works, but then there's also things where you're like, oh that doesn't it isn't like what just a regular show would be like totally totally fascinating so cool so cool yeah what's yeah. next okay there's tons here i had one that was for me but i thought it'd be good because it asked Let's hear it. Uh, it was do you scott do you listen i was fine what her name was uh do you read any uh female mystics and um i was gonna say Teresa of avila is one that i've yep Yep. Her, her experience is incredible. And then Julian of Norwich. Um, I figured you probably had some too. I was just reading about Catherine of Siena. An incredible story about Catherine of Siena is told in Autobiography of a Yogi. Which wow. is Yogananda's. That's a, there's an amazing story about her. And then uh, I always like the writings of Therese Lousseau. Um, mm. I know, and don't you, when you read the mystics, like, wait, this was firmly within the jesus tradition a thousand years ago non-duality paradox wild endless mystery that can be known in its unknownness um it's incredible the god who is known by what and who the god is not <laughs> so good it's care so for the good. earth right meister eckhart a german forget about it forget about it yeah forget yeah, about yeah, it yeah. it's so fascinating to me when people are are like well i'm just i just or stumble into a tradition that is uh, has uh, some element of mysticism to it. And when they discover that the Jesus tradition has this incredibly robust, Thomas Merton, um, incredibly robust way of naming 
this dimension of the experience we're having here. It's amazing. <laughs> it's robust, all right. Uh, <laughs> from Adam, Adam Bows, I believe, Bows. Uh, from, from your perspective, Rob, does the divine have expectations for us? I think the divine is so caught up in joy and the experience we're having here. And expectations often are a form of attachment to how it's supposed to be instead of, instead of letting it be free to be whatever it's going to be. So I generally don't find it interesting when people talk about ultimate reality like it's a person just with superpowers. It often just feels like a superhero version of a person. Um, and obviously throughout history, people have had those conceptions of ultimate reality. But to me, they at some point bump up against limits. Yeah. Um, but when you move to that which is beyond form, yeah, uh, it's not even form and formless. It's that which is beyond form and formless. Which now is who we there's are. a wonder and mystery there. Which is you think like who we are and what we are? That do you think that we're like when I, I thought of that when I went beyond the expectation of like expectations for us to achieve or to do or to go? I, I think about this a lot in education when my kids are learning endless references to things, which is ultimately what we consider an intelligent person. A lot of times they just have a lot of references. That's <laughs> basically um, <laughs> a lot of footnotes. A lot of footnotes, and that's great. That, that's amazing to see that, that we can put that much together. But the hardest thing, and, and probably at the same time, I think best is not the right word, a very good thing to, uh, to go after and to learn is who, who we are. Absolutely. And, and that if you can go after that as the knowledge, like that's the, that's the sacred knowledge, like what are, who, who am I, what, what am I, and, and, and understand that. What, that's why I was asking that. Yeah, and you think about the moments in life when you're most alive, generally have a feeling of timelessness. You're caught up in something. Mm -hmm. You're not checking your watch. No. So you lose track. So there's some sort of, the only thing that's ever been forever is now. That's the only thing that goes on forever. So the moments of full, fullest vitality of life are when time fades, when judgment fades. Is this right, wrong, good, bad? You're just in it that's why we love kids at christmas because they're opening the present and they aren't also going hey look at me opening the present they're just opening the present so there's something about full presence everything and nothing it is almost impossible to hold presence in your hand and yet it's the only game that was ever worth playing so when we talk about the divine in any conceptual categories we've now reduced the divine to that which is this over and against this when in fact the moments of greatest euphoria, joy, aren't even moments when we talk about meaning. Meaning even fades, you know, right? Like the moments that, yes. uh, when Scott Abbott has most felt alive weren't moments when Scott was saying, is this meaningful? I think this is meaningful. No way. You blew past that. Even meaning itself is a category you left behind yeah. when you're in the, presence of an eternal now um so that's why any discussions about god i'm always like this is a lovely discussion but it's the thing after this which is actually what you're interested in yeah you think uh maybe guys like us uh people like us who like to talk a lot <laughs> and and when you i always come to the same thing i'm always like there's not a lot to say right but my business is, is, is saying a lot of things. And I love, I love talking and I love getting into it with people in good ways. I mean, I, I just really love it. It's so how I feel. <laughs> like I have given my life to shaping these experiences for people when the goal all along <laughs> was that none of us would be talking. Like I, I surf most mornings and I don't talk about surfing much because it can't, what do I say? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All yeah. the stuff, my love for Kristen, the stuff that is the stuff of life. I talk about it and I, I sound silly to myself because I'm like attaching these little word groupings to this experience that is so boundless. What would we even say?
Well, you do a good job of it, Rob. Uh, Rob, I love that you just said that. We love to talk knowing that it's a <laughs> fool's errand at some point. <laughs> at some point, for sure. At this point, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was, there, was there a book? This is from Bethany Kalbski. Uh, or I'm going to say Kalbski or Kubski. Uh, was there a book? And she didn't say this, but I'm going to say, was there a book other than the Bible? Um, or an influence that started you on your spiritual journey? Uh, 50 of them. Um, yeah. Lots. Yeah. And how old were you? You know what? I remember my parents were very, uh, how do I say this? Intellectually restless. I remember my dad reading the Wall Street Journal in the morning and he would clip out articles for me. So I remember growing up like, thinking about the world and entertaining new ideas was like baked into the system. I remember my dad giving me C.S. Lewis yeah, as yeah, a kid yeah. and being like, hey, you'd probably find some of this stuff interesting and realizing that, that this guy was telling stories about the big questions and the problem with pain, the great divorce. It was like it was like metaphor, but when you're 14 and late for soccer practice, metaphor, and yet it, it somehow for me, it's like, oh, there's a whole world right here within this one. I distinctly remember reading things like C.S. Lewis as a kid and being like, there's a whole other game here. I know this world that I'm in, there's the popular kids, the not popular kids, the good students, the bad students, the kids who are good music like there's a whole the kids get invited to the right parties but then there's like there's a whole nother game to be played here there's a whole other thing happening that ranks itself it's it's got a different ranking system it's a different playing field that got that somehow got like burned in here i didn't have language for it but that happened even in writing this book i realized how early some sort of alternative universe happened do you, you know what i mean you, yeah, I do. I, I think when I talk about, um, and I heard it said by James Finley very well, labeled as spontaneous uh, contemplative experience. Ah, uh, there you go. Sure. You know, as a kid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I assume to this day, uh, and I shouldn't, that everybody had these feelings. Yeah, right. Uh, me too. And it's yeah. a privilege. It's a privilege because it's ca everybody's capable of them. I'm just not everybody's given the time and space and opportunity always to, to have them. I mean, they can happen anywhere, but uh, some reason I would find myself in, in very quiet contemplative moments. And, and they were, they were yeah. perfect content. I, I didn't know why, I didn't know how, there was no reason to talk about them. That's about as far as you can go with it. I could say that they were in the, in the field and it was beautiful, and, but it wasn't always. Sometimes it was in a lobby of an oil change and show, you know, and they don't, I'm not talking about something that happened all the time that was, completely mystical or magical it was just very calm and um there was a oneness there that that didn't yep. need to be articulated yep 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 i can remember walking to high school and i would run into all these other kids and sometimes just wanting to say like you guys know there's like a whole other thing happening here yeah but not even knowing what i meant by that just you know this isn't everything like there's a but not even having like, it's like even until your brain doesn't even know what it's saying other than your heart is just like, there's, there's, this isn't it. This isn't like, there's an other, this is, we're in 2D here. There's a, there's a 3D version of this. Somehow. Yeah. And you're fresh in 2D too. Cause you're looking back going, man, you know, cause the younger kids, they're kind of still in 3D. They're still there. <laughs> and then some, they step out of it. You know, they step out of it like seven, eight years old. You're going, wait, 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 go back. <laughs> Go back. So my son true. said to my my wife, she said, uh, she said, now Max, do you know what you're supposed to do um, at a uh, Taekwondo tomorrow? And he said, uh, he he said, oh, this is. She said, well, do you know what you're gonna do? And he said, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. How could I know what I'm gonna do? I can't. I can't know what's happening tomorrow. So in the now. So in the, the ridiculous answer the question to ask, what are you going to do? Do you know what you're doing tomorrow? <laughs> well, no, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm here, baby. 
Oh my word, I love it. He had no idea. I was like, yes. Oh my just literally two weeks ago, my daughter Violet and I, I was like, Oh, that'll be fine. And she's like, Rob Bell, you haven't been to the future. That's right. You don't know if it'll be fine, Mr. Rob Bell. You have not been to the future. Don't say that. Love it. It's just so clear to her. Like Love you didn't it. come back from some place to tell us that. You're just looking forward guessing. Stop it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we should do one more, huh? Yeah, yeah. One more. And this is a good one. This is a good one that I think someone would probably want to hear. Heather Swan asks, Do you have rituals for peace or calm? Oh man. This is a how que how question. Yeah, I uh, I'll say mine, and then I'd love to hear yours. I first thing in the morning, I walk the dog, and the dog is pure presence. The dog isn't yesterday or tomorrow. And we've actually our family, we've been having these long philosophical discussions about our dog because through this whole pandemic, our dog is the exact same dog. The dog is. We always laugh. Pure presence. This one. Um, but there's something about the, the morning ritual of walking the dog that is like that I go through this process. Everything I need for today, I will have. Every moment will, whatever is needed for that moment will be there. Um, and I found that the past six months, especially helpful. Um, that's a huge one. And then secondly, for me, I have to move my body or I go crazy. So I go get in the ocean and, and ride some waves and there's dolphins and seals and there's like a whole thing there. Or I'll just go run up the hill or I'll, I just have to move the body. Cause for me, everything about spirit is about body. Um, I have to fully, the body's good. It's good to have your body. It's good to, it's good to have a body. It's good to be in that body. And for me, everything starts there. Um, and then some sort of breakfast. Here we go. Let's get really granular. Some no, sort of good. breakfast that is like, hey, we're really living here. Yeah, I don't skip. It. Like, like this is a good day. This is a big day. This is a completely normal day, which means it's a big day. Man. That's so those cute. are the details. And no. there's a particular, when we got married, you had to register. I don't know if you had this. Back in 93, we got China and we got regular plates. And I remember registering, and that was like a thing at the time where you got um, – so those are in the cupboard, the everyday plates and the nice plates. They're basically both just plain white, but I all I only eat on the fine, the nice ones. <laughs> so, uh, so for me, all meals take place on, back in 1993, somebody said, this was the stuff for the good occasions, but it's 20, we've been married 26 years, 26 years later, every meal happens on the good stuff. And I, I actually, my experience, it's all the little things that add up. It's how you make a life. That's it. I don't think there's anything to add to that. I, I mean, you, when someone asks, what do I, what do I need to do? You need to eat and you need to move. Yeah. And a lot of times what you're saying, a lot of these little things tend to be the problem. Yeah. If we're not doing them, if we just, we just didn't do them. But if yeah. we can get those out of the way, those are yeah. key. I'm with you. A friend of mine always says how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. And it's very Zen. Uh, or like the Rob, uh, the painter Robert Irwin would talk about sanding and painting the back of the painting, which he knew no one would ever see, but he knew in the gallery you would feel the wholeness of the piece. I believe it. Um, I believe it. So I always think about painting the back of the painting. Airtight all the way across life. Um, the stuff on stage is merely a reflection of what's off stage. It's all one whole, and that's how I see it all. So all the, every last detail matters i love it rob we finally met we did and i think this was a great way to do it this was so <laughs> much fun it really was rob I'm yeah glad it was so fun thank you both so so much scott and rob this was sure. awesome thank um, you for sorting this all out yeah. <laughs> well i know we kind of trotted out of the gate unscripted and uh spontaneously so thank there's you no other way we do it no yeah exactly <laughs> Um, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us for this perfectly organic and wonderfully mystical afternoon uh, with Rob Bell and Scott Avitt. Um, Will this be on YouTube? Sorry to interrupt. Will this be on YouTube? Oh, yes. In fact, we were live on oh. YouTube. <laughs> and and uh, 
we will have a, a link of that on our YouTube channel as well. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. So thank okay. you to everyone again. Um, I hope yes, you've thank you everybody. your copy of Everything is Spiritual, which you can pick up from Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C. And if you're looking for something to do on Saturday, hope you'll join us at 4 p.m. ET for a conversation with the always hilarious Michael Ian Black discussing his new book, A Better Man, a mostly serious letter to my son. Um, so thank you all for being here for this mostly serious event. Um, it was so, so, so much fun. Love to you both. Love to everyone. And thank you for thank tuning you. in. Scott, we'll talk again. All right, Rob. Take care. Lots of love.